is in favour of his being a country practitioner who does a great deal of his visiting on foot. Why so? Because this stick, though originally a very handsome one, has been so knocked about that I can hardly imagine a town practitioner carrying it. The thick iron of ferrule is worn down, so it's evident that he has done a great amount of walking with it. Perfectly sound, said Holmes. And then again, there is the friends of the CCH. I should guess that to be the something hunt, the local hunt to those whose members he has possibly given some surgical assistance. And we just made him a small presentation in return. Really, Watson, you excel yourself, said Holmes, pushing back his chair and lighting a cigarette. I am bound to say that in all the accounts which you have been so good to give of my own small achievements, you have habitually underrated your own abilities. It may be that you are not yourself luminous, but you are a conductor of light. Some people without possessing genius have a remarkable power of stimulating it. I confess, my dear fellow, that I am very much in your never said as much before, and I must admit that his words gave me keen pleasure, for I had often been piqued by his indifference to my admiration, and to the attempts which I had made to give publicity to his methods. I was proud, too, to think that I had so far mastered his system as to apply it in a way which earned his approval. He now took the stick from my hands and examined it for a few minutes with his naked eyes. Then, with an expression of interest, he laid down his cigarette and, carrying the cane to the window, he looked over it again with a convex lens. Interesting, though elementary, said he, as he returned to his favourite corner of the city. There are certainly one or two indications upon the stick. It gives us the basis for several deductions. Has anything escaped me, I asked, with some self-importance? I trust that there is nothing of consequence which I have overlooked. I am afraid, my dear Watson, that most of your conclusions were erroneous. When I said that you stimulated me, I meant to be frank. But in noting your fallacies, I was occasionally guided towards the truth. Not that you are entirely wrong in this instance. The man is certainly a country practitioner, and he walks a good deal. Then I was right. To that extent, said Holmes. But that was all. But that was all. No, no, my dear Watson, not all. By no means all. I would suggest, for example, that a presentation to a doctor is more likely to come from a hospital than from a hunt. When the initial CC are placed before that hospital, the words Charing Cross very naturally suggest themselves. You may be right. The probability lies in that direction, and if we take this as a working hypothesis, we have a fresh basis from which to start our construction of this unknown visitor. Well then, supposing that CCH does stand for Charing Cross Hospital, what further inferences may we draw? Do none suggest themselves? You know my methods, apply them. I can only think of the obvious conclusion that the man has practised in town before going to the country. I think that we might venture a little further than this. Look at it in this light. On what occasion would it be most probable that such a presentation would be made? When would his friends unite to give him a pledge of their goodwill? Obviously at that moment when Dr. Morton withdrew from the service of the hospital in order to start a practice for himself. We know there has been a presentation. We believe there has been a change from a town hospital to a country practice. Is it then stretching our inference too far to say that the presentation was on the occasion of the change? It certainly seems probable, I said. Now, you will observe that he could not have been on the staff of the hospital, since only a man well established in a London practice could hold such a position. And such a one would not drift into the country. What was he then? If he was in the hospital and not on the staff, he could only have been a house surgeon or a house physician. Little more than a senior 
a student, and he left five years ago. The date is on the stick. So your grave middle-aged family practitioner vanishes into thin air, my dear Watson. And there emerges a young fellow under thirty, amiable, unambitious, absent-minded, and the possessor of a favourite dog, which I should describe roughly as being larger than a terrier and smaller than a mastiff. I laughed incredulously at, as Sherlock Holmes leaned back in his city and blew little wavering rings of smoke up to the ceiling. As to the latter part, I have no means of checking you, said I, but at least it is not difficult to find out a few particulars about the man's age and professional career. From my small medical shelf I took down the medical dictionary and turned up the name. There were several Mortimers, but only one who could be our visitor. I read his record aloud. Mortimer James MRCS 1882, Grimpen, Dartmoor, Devon. Our surgeon from 
Sudden and tragic death some three months ago created so much. 
Stop. 
about some little time later, Hugo left his guest to carry food and drink, with other worse things perchance, to his captive, and so found the cage empty and the bird escaped. Then, as it would seem, he became as one that hath a devil, for, rushing down the stairs into the dining hall, he sprang upon the great table, flagons and trenchers flying before him, and he cried aloud before all the company that he would, that very night, render his body and soul to the powers of evil if he might but overtake the wench. And while the revellers stood aghast at the fury of the man, one more wicked, or it may be more drunken than the rest, cried out that they should put their hounds upon her. Whereat Hugo ran from the house, crying to his grooms that they should saddle his mare and kennel the pack, and giving the hounds a kerchief of the maids. He swung them to the line, and so off full crying the moonlight over the map over the moor. Now for some space the revellers stood agape, unable to understand all that had been done in such haste. But anon their bemused wits awoke to the nature of the deed which was like to be done upon the moorlands. Everything was now in an uproar, some calling for their pistols, some for their horses, and some for another flask of wine. But at length some sense came back to their crazed minds, and the whole of them, thirteen in number, went to course and started in pursuit. The moon shone clear above them, and they rode swiftly abreast, taking that course which the maid must needs have taken if she were to reach her own home. They had gone a mile or two when they passed one of the night shepherds upon the moorlands, and they cried to him to know if he had seen the hunt. And the man, as the story goes, so grazed with fear that he could scarce speak, but at last he said that he had indeed seen the unhappy maiden with the hounds upon her track. But I've seen more than that, said he, for Hugo Baskerville passed me upon his black mare, and there ran mute behind him such a hound of hell as God forbid it should ever be at my heels. So the drunken squires cursed the shepherd and rode onwards, but soon their skins turned gold for their game as of galloping across the moor, and the black mare dabbled with white of the froth, when past with trailing bridle and empty saddle. Then the revellers rode close together, for a great fear was on them, but they still followed over the moor, though each, had he been alone, would have been right glad to have turned his horse's head. Riding slowly in this fashion, they came at last upon the hounds. These, though known for their valour and their breed, were whimpering in a cluster at the head of a deep dip or coil, as we call it, upon the moor. Some slinking away, and some with starting ackles and staring eyes, gazing down the narrow valley before them. The company had come to a halt, more sober men, as you may guess, than when they started. The most of them would by no means advance, but three of them, the boldest, or it may be the most drunken, rode forward down the coil. Now it opened into a broad space in which stood two of those great stones, still to be seen there which were set by certain forgotten peoples in the days of old. The moon was shining bright upon the clearing, and there in the centre lay the unhappy maid where she had fallen, dead of fear and of fatigue. But it was not the sight of her body, nor yet was it the body of Hugo Baskerville lying near her, which raised the hair upon the heads of these three daredevil moisturers, but it was that standing over Hugo, and plucking at his throat, there stood a foul thing, a great black beast, shaped like a hound, yet larger than any hound that any mortal eye had rested upon. And even as they looked, the thing tore the throat out of Hugo Baskerville, on which it turned its blazing eyes and dripping jaws upon them, the three shrieked with fear and rode for dear life, still screaming across the moor. One, it is 
said died that very night of what he had seen, and the other twain were but broken men for the rest of their days. Such is the tale, my sons, of the coming of the hound, which is said to have plagued the family so sorely ever since. If I have said it down, it is because that which is clearly known have less terror than that which is but hinted at and guessed. Nor can it be denied that many of the family have been unhappy in their deaths, which have been sudden, bloody and mysterious. Yet may we shelter ourselves in the infinite goodness of providence, which would not forever punish the innocent beyond that third or fourth generation which is threatened in holy writ. To that providence, my sons, I hereby commend you, and I counsel you by way of caution to forbear from crossing the moor in those dark hours when the powers of evil are exalted. This from Hugo Baskerville to his sons Roger and John, with instructions that they say nothing thereof to their sister, Elizabeth. When Dr. Mortimer had finished reading this singular narrative, he pushed his spectacles up on his forehead and stared across at Mr. Sherlock Holmes. The latter yawned and tossed the end of his cigarette into the fire. Well, said he, do you not find it interesting? To a collector of fairy tales, Dr. Mortimer drew a folded newspaper out of his pocket. And now, Mr. Holmes, we will give you something a little more recent. This is the Devon County Chronicle of June 14th of this year. It is a short account of the facts elicited at the death of Sir Charles Baskerville, which occurred a few days before that date. My friend leaned a little forward, and his expression became intent. Our visitor readjusted his glasses and began. The recent sudden death of Sir Charles Baskerville whose name has been mentioned as the probable Liberal candidate for Mid-Devon at the next election, has cast a gloom over the county. Though Sir Charles had resided at Baskerville Hall for a comparatively short period, his amiability of character and extreme generosity had won the affection and respect of all who had been brought into contact with him. In these days of novo riches, it is refreshing to find a case where the Scion of an old county family, which has fallen upon evil days, is able to make his own fortune and to bring it back with him to restore the fallen grandeur of his line. Sir Charles, as is well known, made large sums of money in South African speculation. More wise than those who go on until the wheel turns against them, he realised his gains and returned to England with them. It is only two years since he took up his residence at Baskerville Hall, and it is common talk how large were those schemes of reconstruction and improvement which have been interrupted by his death. Being himself childless, it was his openly expressed desire that the whole countryside should, within his own lifetime, profit by his good fortune, and many will have personal reasons for bewailing his untimely end. Generous donations to local and county charities have been frequently chronicled in these columns. The circumstances connected with the death of Sir Charles cannot be said to have been entirely cleared up by the inquest, but at least enough has been done to dispose of those rumours to which local superstition has given rise. There is no reason whatever to suspect foul play to imagine that death could be from any but natural causes. Sir Charles was a widower, and a man who may be said to have been in some ways of an eccentric habit of mind. In spite of his considerable wealth, he was simply in his personal tastes, and his indoor servants at Baskerville Hall consisted of a married couple named Barrymore, the husband acting as butler and 
manifesting itself in changes of colour, breathlessness, and acute attacks of nervous depression. Dr. James Mortimer, the friend and medical attendant of the deceased, has given evidence to the same effect. The facts of the case are simple. Sir Charles Baskerville was in the abbot every night before going to bed of walking down the famous Yew Valley of Baskerville Hall. The evidence of the Barrymore shows that this had been his custom. On the 4th of June, Sir Charles had declared his intention of starting next day for London, and had ordered Barrymore to prepare his luggage. That night, he went out as usual for his nocturnal walk, in the course of which he was in the habit of smoking a cigar. He never returned. At 12 o'clock, Finding the hall, the hall door still open, became alarmed, and lighting a lantern, went in search of his master. The day had been wet, and Sir Charles's footmarks were easily traced down the valley. Halfway down this walk, there is a gate which leads out onto the moor. There were indications that Sir Charles had stood for some little time here. He then had proceeded down the valley, and it was at the far end of it his body was discovered. One fact which has not been explained is the statement of Barrymore that his master's footprints altered their character from the time that he passed the moor gate, and that he appeared from thence onward to have been walking upon his toes. One Murphy, a gypsy horse dealer, was on the moor at no great distance at the time, but he appears by his own confession to have been the worse for drink. He declares that he heard cries, but is unable to state from what direction they came. No signs of violence were discovered upon Sir Charles's person, though the doctor's evidence pointed to an almost incredible facial distortion. So great that Dr. Mortimer refused at first to believe that it was indeed his friend and patient who lay before him. It was explained that that is a symptom which is not unusual in cases of dyspnea and death from cardiac exhaustion. This explanation was borne out by the post-mortem examination, which showed long-standing organic disease, and the coroner's jury returned a verdict in accordance with the medical evidence. It is well that this is so. It is obviously of the utmost importance that Sir Charles's heir should settle at the hall and continue the good work that has been so sadly interrupted. With the prosaic finding of the coroner not finally put an end to the romantic stories which have been whispered in connection with the affair, it might have been difficult to find a tenant for Baskerville Hall. It is understood that the next of kin is Mr. Henry Baskerville. If he be still alive, the son of Sir Charles Baskerville's younger brother. The young man we last heard of was in America, and inquiries are being instituted with a view to informing him of his good fortune. Dr. Mortimer refolded his paper and placed it in his pocket. Those are the public facts, Mr. Holmes, in connection with the death of Sir Charles Baskerville. I must thank you, said Sherlock Holmes, for calling my attention to a case which certainly presents some features of interest. I had observed some newspaper comment at the time, but I was exceedingly preoccupied by that little affair of the Vatican cameos, and in my anxiety to oblige the Pope, I lost touch with several interesting English cases. This article, you say, contains all the public facts. It does. Then let me have the private ones. He leaned back, put his fingertips together, and assumed his most impassive and judi judicial expression. In doing so, said Dr. Mortimer, who had begun to show some signs of strong emotion, I am telling that which I have not confided to anyone. My motive for withholding it from the coroner's inquiry is that a man of science shrinks from placing himself in the public position of seeming to endorse a popular superstition. I have the further motive that Baskerville Hall, as the paper 
Jesus says, would certainly remain untenanted, untenanted if anything were done to increase its already rather grim reputation. For both these reasons I thought that I was justified in telling rather less than I knew, since no practical good could result from it. But with you there is no reason why I should not be perfectly frank. The moor is very sparsely inhabited, and those who live near each other are thrown very much together. For this reason I saw a good deal of Sir Charles Baskerville, with the exception of Mr. Franklin of Lovedall Hall, and Mr. Stapleton, the naturalist. There are no other men of education within many miles. Sir Charles was a retiring man, but the chance of his illness brought us together and a, communi a community of interests in science kept us so. He had brought back much scientific information from South Africa, and many a charming evening we have spent together discussing the comparative anatomy of the Bushmen and the Hinton Dot. Within the last few months it became increasingly plain to me that Sir Charles's nervous system was strained to the breaking point. He had taken this legend which I have read you exceedingly to heart, so much so that he would walk in his own grounds. Nothing would induce him to go out upon the moor at night. Incredible as it may appear to you, Mr. Holmes, he was honestly convinced that a dreadful fate overhung his family, and certainly the records which he was able to give his, of his ancestors were not encouraging. The idea of some ghastly presence constantly haunted him, and on more than one occasion he asked me whether I had my, on my medical journeys at night, ever seen any strange creature or heard the baying of a hound. The latter question he put to me several times, and always with a voice which vibrated with excitement. I can well remember driving up to his house in the evening, some three weeks before the fatal event. He chanced to be at his hall door. I had descended from my gig and was standing in front of him, when I saw his eyes fix themselves over my shoulder, and stare past me with an expression of the most dreadful horror. I whisked round and had just time to catch a glimpse of something which I took to be a large black calf, passing at the head of the drive. So excited and alarmed was he that I was compelled to go down to the spot where the animal had been, and look around for it. It was gone, however, and the incident appeared to make the worst impression upon his mind. I stayed with him all the evening, and it was on that occasion to explain the emotion which he had shown, but he confined it to my keeping that narrative which I read to you when I first came. I mention this small episode because it assumes some importance in view of the tragedy which followed, but I was convinced at the time that the matter was entirely trivial, and that his excitement had no justification. It was at my advice that Sir Charles was about to go to London. His heart was, I knew, affected, and the constant anxiety in which he lived, however chimerical the cause of it might be, was evidently having a serious effect upon his health. I thought that a few months among the distractions of town would send him back a new man. Mr. Stapleton, a new friend, a mutual friend, who was much concerned at his state of health, was of the same opinion. At the last instant came this terrible catastrophe. On the night of Sir Charles's death, Barrymore the butler, who made the discovery, sent Perkins, the groom, on horseback to me, and I was sitting up late. I was able to reach Baskerville Hall within an hour of the event. I checked and corroborated all the facts which were mentioned at the inquest. I followed the footsteps down the Yew Valley. I saw the spot at the Moorgate where he seemed to have waited. I remarked the change in the shape of the prints after that point. I noted there were no other footsteps, save those of Barrymore and the soft gravel. And 
finally I carefully examined the body, which had not been touched until my arrival. Sir Charles lay on his face, his arms out, his fingers dug into the ground, and his features convulsed with some strong emotion to such an extent that I could hardly have sworn to his identity. There was certainly no physical injury of any kind, but one false statement was made by Barrymore at the inquest. He said that there were no traces upon the ground around the body. He did not observe any, but I did. Some little distance off, but fresh and clear. Footprints. Footprints. A man or a woman. Dr. Mortimer looked strangely at us for an instant, and his voice sank almost to a whisper as he answered. Mr. Holmes, they were the footprints of a gigantic hound. Nice. Now we move on to chapter number three, titled The Problem. I confess at these words, a shudder passed through me. There was a thrill in the doctor's voice which showed that he was himself deeply moved by that which he told us. Holmes leaned forward in his excitement, and his eyes had the hard, dry glitter which shot from them when he was keenly interested. You saw this, as clearly as I see you, and you said nothing. What was the use? How was it that no one else saw it? The marks were some twenty yards from the body, and no one gave them a thought. I don't suppose I should have done so, had I not known this legend. There are many sheepdogs on the moor. No doubt, but this was no sheepdog. You say it was large, enormous. But it had not approached the body, no. What sort of night was it? Damp and raw. But not actually raining, no. What is the alley like? lines of old yew edge, twelve feet high and impenetrable. The walk in the centre is about eight feet across. Is there anything between the edges and the walk? Yes, there is a strip of grass about six feet broad on either side. I understand that the yew edge is penetrated at one point by a gate. Yes, the wicket gate, which leads on the moor. Is there any other opening? None. So that to reach the U Valley one either has to come down it from the house or else to enter it by the moor gate. There is an exit through the summer house at the far end. Had Sir Charles reached this? No. He lay about fifty yards from it. Now tell me, Dr. Mortimer, and this is important, the marks which you saw were on the path and not on the grass. No marks could show on the grass. Were they on the same side of the path as the moor gate? Yes, they were on the edge of the path on the same side as the moor gate. You interest me exceedingly. Another point. Was the wicket gate closed? Closed and padlocked. How high was it? About four feet high. Then anyone could have got over it. Yes. And what marks did you see by the wicked gate? None in particular. Good heaven, did no one examine? Yes, I examined myself. And found nothing. It was all very confused. Sir Charles had evidently stood there for five or ten minutes. How do you know that? Because the ash had twice dropped from his cigar. Excellent. This is a colleague, Watson, after our own art. But the marks... He had left his own marks all over that small patch of gravel. I could discern no others. Sherlock Holmes struck his hand against his knee with an impatient gesture. If I had only been there, he cried, it is evidently a case of extraordinary interest, and one which presented immense opportunities to the scientific expert. That gravel page upon which I might have read so much has been long ere this much by the rain and effaced by the clocks of curious peasants. Oh, Dr. Mortimer, Dr. Mortimer, to think that you should not have called me in. You have indeed much to answer for. I could not call you in, Mr. Holmes, without disclosing these facts to the world, and I have already given my reasons for not wishing to do so. Besides, besides, why do you hesitate?
hesitates at times. There is a realm in which the most acute and most experienced of detectives is helpless. You mean that the thing is supernatural? I did not positively say so. No, but you evidently think it. Since the tragedy, Mr. Holmes, there have come to my ears several incidents which are hard to reconcile with the settled order of nature. For example, asked Holmes, I find that before the terrible event occurred, several people have seen a creature upon the moor, which corresponds with this Baskerville demon, and which could not possibly be any animal known to science. They all agree that it was a huge creature, luminous, ghastly, and spectral. I have cross-examined these men, one of them a hard-headed countryman, one a farrier, and one a moorland farmer. All tell me the same story of this dreadful apparition, exactly corresponding to the hellhound of this legend. I assure you that there is a reign of terror in the district, and that it is a hardy man who will cross the moor at night. And you, a trained man of science, believe it to be supernatural. I do not know what to believe. Holmes shrugged his shoulders. I have hitherto confined my investigations to this world, said he. In a modest way I have combated evil, but to take on the father of evil himself would perhaps be too ambitious a task. Yet you must admit that the footmark is material. The original hound was material enough to tug a man's throat out, and yet he was diabolical as well. I see that you have quite gone over to the supernaturalists, but now, Dr. Mortimer, tell me this. If you hold these views, why have you come to consult me at all? You tell me in the same breath that it is useless to investigate Sir Charles's death, and that you desire me to do it. I did not say that I desire you to do it. Then, how can I assist you? By advising me so as what I should do with Sir Henry Baskerville, who arrives at Waterloo Station. Dr. Mortimer looked at his watch. In exactly one hour and a quarter. He being the heir. Yes, on the death of Sir Charles, we inquired for his young gentleman. And found that he had been farming in Canada. From the accounts which have reached us, he is an excellent fellow in every way. I speak now not as a medical man, but as a trustee and an executor of Sir Charles's will. There is no other claimant, I presume. None. The only other kinsman, kinsman whom we have been able to trace was Roger Baskerville, the youngest of three brothers, of whom poor Sir Charles was the elder. The second brother who died young is the father of this lad, Henry. The third, Roger, was the black sheep of the family. He came of the old masterful Baskerville strain and was the very image, they tell me, of the family picture of old Hugo. He made England too hot to hold him, fled to Central America and died there in 1876 of yellow fever. Henry is the last of the Baskervilles. One hour and five minutes I meet him at Waterloo Station. I have had a wire that he arrived at Southampton this morning. Now, Mr. Holmes, what would you advise me to do with him? Why should he not go to the home of his father's? It seems natural, does it not? And yet consider that every Baskerville who goes there meets with an evil fate. I feel sure that if Sir Charles could have spoken with me before his death, he would have warned me against bringing this, the last of the old race and the heir to the great wealth, to that deadly place. And yet it cannot be denied that the prosperity of the whole poor bleak countryside depends upon his presence. All the good work that had been done by Sir Charles will crash to the ground if there is no tenant of the hall. I fear lest I should be swayed too much by my own obvious interest in the matter. And that is why I bring the case before you and ask for your advice. Holmes considered for a little time. But into plain words the matter is this, said he. In your opinion there is a diabolical agency which makes Darmore an unsafe abode for a Baskerville. That 
that's your opinion. At least I might go the length of saying that there is some evidence that this may be so. Exactly. But surely, if your supernatural theory be correct, it could work the young man evil in London as easily as in Devonshire. A devil with merely local powers like a parish vestry would be too inconceivable a thing. You put the matter more flippantly, Mr. Holmes, than you would probably do if you were brought into personal contact with these things. Your advice then, as I understand it, is that the young man will be as safe in Devonshire as in London. He comes in fifty minutes. What would you recommend? I recommend, sir, that you take a cab, call off your spaniel who is scratching at my front door, and proceed to Waterloo to meet Sir Henry Baskerville. And then, and then you will see nothing to him at all until I have made my mind up about the matter. How long will it take you to make up your mind? Twenty-four hours. At ten o'clock tomorrow, Dr. Mortimer, I will be much obliged to you if you will call upon me here. And I will be of help to me in my plans for the future if you will bring Sir Henry Baskerville with you. I will do so, Mr. Holmes. He scribbled the appointment on his shirt cuff and hurried off in his strange, peering, absent minded fashion. Holmes stopped him at the head of the stair. Only one more question, Dr. Mortimer. You say that before Sir Charles Baskerville's death, several people saw this apparition upon the moor. Three people did. Did any see it after? I've not heard of any. Thank you. Returned to his seat with that quiet look of inward satisfaction which meant that he had a congenial task before him. Going out, Watson, unless I can help you. No, my dear fellow, it is at the hour of action that I turn to you for aid, but this is splendid, really unique from some points of view. When you pass Bradley's, would you ask him to send up a pound of the strongest shag tobacco? Thank you. It would be as well if you could make it convenient not to return before evening. Then I should be very glad to compare impressions as to this most interesting problem which has been submitted to us this morning. I knew that seclusion and solitude were very necessary for my friend in those hours of intense mental concentration, during which he weighed every particle of evidence, constructed alternative theories, balanced one against the other, and made up his mind as to which points were essential and which immaterial. I therefore spent the day at my club, and did not return to Baker Street until evening. Uh, it was nearly nine o'clock when I found myself in the sitting room once more. My first impression as I opened the door was that a fire had broken out. For the room was so filled with smoke that the light of the lamp upon the table was blurred by it. As I ended, however, my fears were set at rest, for it was the acrid fumes of strong coarse tobacco which took me by the throat and sent me coughing. Through the haze I had a vague vision of Holmes in his dressing gown coiled up in an armchair, with his black clay pipe between his lips. Several rolls of paper lay around him, Watson, said he. No, it's this poisonous atmosphere. I suppose it is pretty thick, said Holmes, now that you mention it. Thick. It is intolerable. Open the window, then. You've been at your club all day, I perceive. My dear Holmes, am I right? Certainly, but how? He laughed at my bewildered expression. There is a delightful freshness about you, Watson, which makes it a pleasure to exercise any small powers which I possess at your expense. A gentleman goes forth on a showery and miry day. He returns immaculate in the evening with a cloth still on his hat and his boots. He has been a fixture there for all day. He is not a man with intimate friends. Where then could he have been? Is it not obvious? Well, it is rather obvious. The world is full of obvious things which nobody by any chance ever observes. Where do you think that I have been? A fixture also. On the contrary, I have been to Devonshire. In spirit. Exactly. My body has remained in this armchair and has, I regret to observe, consumed in my absence two large pots of coffee and an incredibly amount, an incredible amount of tobacco. After you left, I sent down to Stanford's for the ordnance map of this poor 
stretch along this line, with the moor, as you perceive, up on the right of it. This small clump of buildings here is the hamlet of Grimpen, where our friend Dr. Mortimer has his headquarters. Within a radius of five miles there are, as you see, only a very few scattered dwellings. Here is Laughter Hall, which was mentioned in the narrative. There is a house indicated here which may be the residence of the naturalist Stapleton. Here are two moorland farmhouses, Idor and Falmire. Then fourteen miles away the great convict prison of Princetown. Between and around these scattered points extends the desolate, lifeless moor. This then is the stage upon which tragedy has been played, and upon which we may help to play it again. It must be a wild place, I said. Yes, the setting is a worthy one. If the devil did desire to have a hand in the affairs of men, then you are yourself inclining to supernatural explanation. The devil's agents may be of flesh and blood, may they not, I'm said. There are two questions waiting for us at the outset. The one is whether any crime has been committed at all. The second is what is the crime and how was it committed. Of course, if Dr. Mortimer's surmise should be correct, and we are dealing with forces outside the ordinary laws of nature, there is an end to our investigation. But we are bound to exhaust all other hypotheses before falling back upon this one. I think we'll shut that window again, if you don't mind. It is a singular thing, but I find that a concentrated atmosphere helps a concentration of thought. I have not pushed it to the length of getting into a box to think, but that is the logical outcome of my convictions. Have you turned the case over in your mind? Yes, I have thought a good deal of it in the course of the day. What do you make of it, said Holmes? It is very bewildering. It has certainly a character of its own. There are points of distinction about it. The change in the footprints, for example. What do you make of that? Mortimer said that the man had walked on tiptoe down the portion of the alley. It's only repeated what some fool had said at the inquest. Why would a man walk on tiptoe down the valley? What then? He was running Watson. Running desperately, running for his life, running until he burst his heart and fell dead upon his face. Running from what? There lies our problem. There are indications that the man was crazed with fear before he ever began to run. How can you say that? I am presuming that the cause of his fears came to him across the moor. If that was so, and it seems most probable, only a man who had lost his wits would have run from, from the house instead of towards it. If the gypsy's evidence may be taken as true, he ran with cries for help in the direction where help was least likely to be. Then again, whom was he waiting for that night? And why was he waiting for him in the Yew Valley rather than his own house? You think he was waiting for someone? The man was elderly and infirm. We can understand his taking an evening stroll, but the ground was damp. And the night inclement. Is it natural that he should stand for five or ten minutes, as Dr. Mortimer, with more practical sense than I should have given him credit for, deduced from the cigar ash? But he went out every evening. I think it is unlikely that he waited at the moorgate every evening. On the contrary, the evidence is that he avoided the moor. That night he waited there. It was the night before he made his departure for London. The thing takes shape from Watson. It becomes coherent. Might I ask you to hand me my violin? And we will postpone all further thought upon this business until we have had the advantage of meeting Dr. Mortimer. Sir Henry Baskerville in the morning. Chapter 4 is going to be titled Sir Henry Baskerville, but we are well going for an hour into the reading, and I think it's time that I myself.
this word in it, like the 1800s maybe. I, I may have completely and utterly made that, made that up. I also found myself just naturally doing this reading, uh, doing a bit more of a posher English voice, but I guess it kind of fits that uh, Sorry.